morning. I'm Mary Hirsch, and I am the Director of Religious Education here at the Community Church. About four and a half years ago, Jacqueline Brett, who was our church's membership director at the time, suggested to us that the church staff should take the Racial Equity Institute training together. Jacqueline said that she had done a lot of different, similar trainings, and that this one was a really good one. So we decided to attend the training workshop together. REI phase one training is two full days, and I was nervous about it. Like most white people who live in America and who care about racial justice at all, I felt like I knew a lot about race in America just from having lived here. So I was dubious about the utility of doing this, I wasn't sure that they could tell me anything I didn't already know, and I was afraid that they would tell us to do things that were either politically impractical, naive, or would ask too much of me. I didn't realize it at the time, but I truly had no hope that racial equity was possible. It seemed to me that things in America were probably as good as they could get. Even though this view required that I look the other way at a lot of injustice and that I not notice that my own life wasn't particularly integrated or diverse. Now going to a training is always a hopeful thing. If it's a training that you are required to attend, at a minimum you hope that it won't be boring <laughs> or a complete waste of time. If it's a training that you want to attend, you hope that it will be inspiring and that you will learn something that you don't know that, and will have a genuine life-changing application. I am a deeply pessimistic person. <laughs> and the way I manage disappointment and unexpected heartbreak in my life is to be as pessimistic as possible, as much as possible. <laughs> so it is hard for me to do hopeful things. But I wanted to do this. I was hopeful despite my instinct to be pessimistic. Mostly I was hopeful because I trusted Jacqueline. She is a person of color, so I knew that she had a stake in, thing, in things being genuinely helpful. And we had already had many inspiring conversations, which I had learned so much from. So I thought it might be different than the other workshops I had done over the years. Workshops which seemed to make things worse, not better. So off we went. Tom and Jacqueline and Peter and I. We went to the United Church in Chapel Hill where we gathered with 50 people from our Chapel Hill Carborough community, a Carborough police chief, detectives from the Chapel Hill Police Department, teachers, healthcare workers, politicians, and staff from other churches. It was a diverse group. And the trainers were also diverse in terms of race and age. They were funny and very smart. And the training was full of things I, in fact, did not know. And it presented an analysis of racism in America that was unlike anything I had heard before. In its comprehensiveness, its history, psychology, economics, and politics. It was holistic, and it wasn't boring at all. The trainers gave an analysis of systemic racism in America that results in all the things we see and experience. And then at the end, the trainers said, and this is a paraphrase, not what they actually said, but what I heard them say. They said, guess what? We do not have a list of 10 things you can personally do or 10 things that your organization can do to fix racism. Because actually, Racism is really resistant to being eradicated. It is baked right into everything. It is super complicated, and it would be like malpractice for us to suggest that there is something simple that you could do that would fix this thing that has been with us since the country's founding. The ideology of white supremacy, which is the energy that feeds systemic racism, permeates everything. If this were easy to solve, it would already be fixed. So that's pretty disappointing, right? 
not for me. I had this intense, surprising relief and even joy because it had the ring of truth to it. And then they said this, just because it's a monumental problem doesn't mean that improvement is not possible. It means that your expectations have to change. It means that your solu solutions are based on different assumptions. If what is wrong is white supremacy and it's baked into almost everything, we have to unbake it. We have to untangle it. And that's not easy at all. So the first thing we're going to ask of you is to go home and to sit with this information and analysis and let it soak in. And the second thing we're going to ask of you is to continue to learn and deepen your knowledge and be curious. That's it. Just being aware and knowledgeable will change you in ways you do not know. You are all gatekeepers and leaders in your communities and organizations, and this analysis, this information will inform your leadership, and you will begin to dismantle systemic racism. And by the way, you can come back to one of these trainings anytime for free, except for paying for the food, to refresh and deepen your knowledge. For me, knowing the scope of the problem was such a gift. Finally, I learned something about racism in America that actually aligned with my personal experience of racism, which is that it is a deeply persistent and pervasive problem. So much of talking about racism lately in America has been about whether this or that person is racist. The focus on individuals and their behavior and intent is such a distraction from the underlying system, which continues to thrive. I love this idea that if we can just see a problem more clearly and more truly, just the seeing of it will be its eventual, eventual undoing. I love the idea that our job is to be awake. It is a spiritual truth that all we really need to do is be awake. Not just about race, but about everything. Truly awake. Because if you are truly awake, <coughs> the rest will follow. Compassion towards yourself and to others will follow. Discernment will follow. Hope will follow. Energy for the work will follow. And action will follow that. So after REI training and learning about system, learning that systemic racism is a huge monster with tentacles wrapped around and in almost every aspect of American life, I felt awake. I returned to my work in ministry with the energy to work on this issue after years of doing nothing, really, for most of my life, except for being sad about it, anxious, guilty, despairing, self-righteous, and mostly asleep. If you are white in America, you can choose mostly to ignore racism for minutes, hours, days, and years at a time. You can throw up your hands and say, racism. It's like death and taxes. There's nothing you can really do. People of color do not have that choice. They cannot ignore it. So I have done more in the past four years to work for racial equity than I've done in the first 50. And one of the things that I've worked on is getting other people to participate in racial equity institute training, particularly young people and the people in this church. And I want to thank our church endowment who has made a grant for people in our congregation to participate in this training. Now, I'm not a great activist and I'm not really in great shakes. And many of you are doing more to create racial equity. I'm making mistakes and I'm flawed. But as a religious person, a person of faith who is committed to and trying to live principles, for me, it is crucial to my integrity as a human being to be awake, to work for justice in my everyday life and work. So now I'm doing things, and that is so much better than not doing things. What I really wanted to share with you is this insight that I have had, that if we just make a commitment to being awake to inequity and starting to understand it, that the humility, energy, 
hope, discernment, and action will naturally come from that. I also wanted to share with you four amateur tips about being awake. The first thing I recommend is attending something like Racial Equity Institute training or a similar workshop in person. There's a lot being read, written that you could read that is good that you could substitute for it. But there is something very transformative about learning in your own community, in a group of people that you work and live with. There is something very powerful about learning from inspiring teachers and leaders. The fact that we did it together as a church staff has been very important in my development. The second recommendation that I have, which I also got from Jacqueline, who is now the assistant minister at Eno River UU. Thank you, Jacqueline. She pointed out to me that a lot of white people don't have any or many black friends. They don't have relationships with people of color. And since she pointed that out to me, and I saw that was true in my own life, I have made it a priority to live a more integrated life to seek relationships and connections with people of color in an organic way. It would be weird and rude to make friends with people just based on the color of their skin. However, we know that relationship is central to the spiritual life, that being in relationship is what teaches us justice and love, and that justice and love are nothing but ideas if they are not lived in practice. My third recommendation is also for white people. To make a spiritual discipline of being aware that you are white every day. As I have said, one of the spiritual disadvantages of being white is that it is easy to be asleep to racial injustice and white supremacy. It is easy to be comfortable, and there are so many worthy distractions. There's work, family, gardening, UNC basketball. This is this idea I got from Sarah Verbeest, who is a member of our congregation. She made this her New Year's resolution for this year. She calls it getting comfortable with the discomfort of being white. Her resolution has two parts. One of it is the being awake part, taking notice of what is happening around her, noticing her whiteness and being uncomfortable with it, and just sitting with it. The second part of it is speaking up. Practice noticing out loud, not always at the same time or about the same things, but practicing noticing out loud. And I have copied her resolution for myself, not as diligently. My fourth recommendation for being awake is to be involved in productive and ongoing conversations with people you trust about dismantling racism, and understanding how race functions in our institutions and hearts. And I have a number of these ongoing conversations which I feel are such a great blessing. I, I have um, lunch with my brother every week and this is a frequent topic of conversation for us. But one of the most important conversations and my longest conversation about systemic racism and white supremacy is with Tom, our minister. Because we took REI training together, we have this common understanding, experience, and vocabulary. And soon as we started, soon as we took the training, we really started talking regularly. Part of the reason why we wanted to do the services together is as an, out, an outcome of this ongoing conversation. It's organic. We didn't plan to start it, and we don't have a weekly meeting where we talk about racism. Instead, it is integrated into our work together. And I wasn't really aware of how important this ongoing conversation with Tom has been to me and my efforts to be awake until I started thinking about giving this talk. And he and I were talking and I had this um, overwhelming feeling of gratitude about the companionship that we have. And I think it's very important to have people in your life that you're really talking to about the important things. So those are four suggestions.
There are so many ways to wake up and even more ways to move to action. I could go on, but I'm not going to. What I have learned about being awake to white supremacy and systemic racism is being awake has been the engine for meaningful action for me, and it has been an antidote to my despair and cynicism and bitterness and anger and guilt and shame, and most importantly, 